Yeah, <laughs> zombie walk. Yeah, when does that start again? Yeah. If you're walking dead, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jack's here. All right. You ready? Yep. All right. All right, so hi, guys. Uh, my name is Michael Simon. I'm from Cal State Long Beach, in California. Uh, and my advisor is Dr. Jacques Lamar. I'm going to talk to you guys about submonolayer growth and nucleation. In particular, I'm going to talk to you about subdiffusive forms. So just a quick overview. First, I'm going to introduce uh, what is this growth and nucleation thing? Why are we interested in it? I'm going to talk a little bit about classical nucleation theory. And I'm going to go into specifically subdiffusion, how it differs from the classical picture and why I'm interested in it. Um, we're going to go over how we simulate it. We're going to talk about our results and then conclude. So basically, what we want to do is we want to study how things grow. Okay. And in particular, we want to look at how things grow under things like thin film deposition. So the idea is you deposit materials, atoms, particles, whatever, and they diffuse around the surface and form little structures. And we want to study this computationally and theoretically. And in short, the reason why this is important is because thin films are literally everywhere. Um, these processes are used to make the microprocessors in your phone, they're used to make solar cells. We've seen two or three times, I think, on solar cells. So we really want to understand how these processes actually cause these structures to grow, in particular in the sub monolayer before we build up a full layer. So the general picture is this. You deposit things. We model this with rates, okay? the diffusion rate and the deposition rate. So you deposit something with some flux f that's related to deposition. And in the meantime, things on the surface can diffuse around. And how often things are deposited versus how often things diffuse is kind of a key variable of interest. And this, this monster, uh, these are called the rate equations. So this is analytically how we model the time evolution of the density of monomers, so the density of guys that are diffusing around on the surface, and the density of islands, which are little clusters that stick together and no longer move. So these equations are general, and they describe the time evolution of these cluster densities and of these monomer densities. And the, the program of, of doing this sort of thing theoretically is to solve these guys for variables that are particularly interesting. And perhaps the key result is what's called the peak island density scale. So that's this NP. And what comes out is that we find that the peak island density scales as d over f, so this is diffusion rate over deposition flux, to the power minus chi. And this chi is kind of the key variable that we're looking at. And the classical picture, the classical uh, nucleation picture, is that it comes out to be this i over i plus 2. Now here, i is the critical island size. So that is to say, something, a cluster, which has a size of i plus 1, is stable and no longer moves around. So we call that a stable island. Now, the problem with this is that this only holds for normal diffusion, okay? particles that just diffuse around randomly. But there are different kinds of diffusion. So there's this normal diffusion, which is what that picture was of, and that's essentially a random walker, a normal random walker. So every unit of time, I decide randomly where I'm going to go, and I take one step in that direction. But also, you can have this thing called super diffusion, whereby when I decide to take a step, maybe I'll take two or three steps instead of just one step. So each time I switch directions, I'm going to go some distance, which is called a persistence length, before I stop and switch directions again. On the flip side of that, we have this sub diffusion, where instead of taking longer steps, now I'm going to wait some time before I take the next step. And in particular, what we're looking at is a power law distribution of these waiting times. So I take a step, I wait some random time that follows some distribution, and then I take another step. So quantitatively, these different kinds of diffusion can be characterized by how their mean squared displacement varies with time. So for normal diffusion, the mean squared displacement, so if you start doing a random walk, the mean square distance from where you start scales as just t. This exponent is 1. For super diffusion, you go farther. You use greater than 1. And for sub diffusion, you don't get as far. You use less than 1. 
Now, as I said earlier, I'm, my project is on subdiffusion, and I find subdiffusion particularly interesting. Oh, but before I tell you about that, there's a physical, there are lots of physical examples of all of these things, but in particular, a previous one, which I think the previous REU student working for Dr. Amar was uh, working on, is pentacene growth, where the theory that I showed you guys before doesn't hold, and we think that it's because they're actually super diffusive. The atoms have a weaker interaction with the substrate, and so they go farther before they switch direction. Now subdiffusion, subdiffusion is what I think is cool, and one of the reasons is because it hasn't been studied yet in this nucleation context. So nobody, it's been studied mathematically, some of the properties of the distributions, um, but nobody has studied it from the perspective of island nucleation and growth. And it is physically relevant. Um, an example is xerography, which comes from the Xerox machine. It has to do with how electrons are biased to move and something in there. Um, it also shows up in disordered glasses, and anywhere where the thing you're depositing on has kind of surface defects or an irregular shape that can cause large distributions of hopping potential. So basically, somebody can get stuck in a certain spot, and then they're there longer than they are somewhere that isn't as deep of a well, let's say. So how do we simulate this? We know that the theory doesn't deal with it yet. But we can simulate it, and we can simulate it using a tool called Kinetic Monte Carlo. So the program of Kinetic Monte Carlo is to evolve a system where you know the rates of the events of that system. So the basic steps are, you make a list of all the rates of all the possible events that can happen in the system, and then you pick an event, and which event you pick is proportional to its rate compared to all the other rates. Then you update the lists, and then you do this process again. And you keep doing this, you keep evolving your system with these known rates. Now, to do kinetic Monte Carlo for these subdiffusive walkers, we actually take a time-based approach, where we look at the times before the next event rather than the rate. So these things are equivalent, right, because one over the time is the rate, but because these guys have these waiting times, so each walker has a waiting time that follows this distribution, pick a random number between 0 and 1, and we take it to the power minus 1 over mu. Um, this isn't random, this comes from something, but I'll get to that in a second. But because each, because each monomer, because each walker has this natural waiting time, it's a little bit more natural to look at this from a time before next event picture rather than from a rate picture. So what we do is for each walker, we generate this tau. So this tau comes from a power law distribution of waiting times which comes from an exponential distribution of hopping potentials on a surface, and it does reproduce the correct uh, mean squared displacement value for subdiffusion. Then we generate a tau deposition, so that's the time before the next deposition. So we have the waiting times of all these walkers. The time before the next deposition is this other random number. And then basically what we do is we run through the list of all these taus, and we find the minimum one. So the minimum tau means the minimum waiting time before the next event. And whatever that event is, that's what we do. So if it's a diffusion, we diffuse that walker that had the lowest waiting time. If it's a deposition, we deposit. And then we update all the times. Right? So now we've waited this time, we update everybody's tau, and we do this process again. And we keep doing this until we get to a range of coverage that we want. So some details. Um, our simulations are for i equals 1. So that means that a cluster of two particles forms an island that no longer moves. So one guy can bounce around, and then if he hits something else, he's stuck. Okay? We're doing this on a square lattice of about 2,000 by 2,000, so we can do bigger or smaller systems. And we expect that the classical theory is not going to hold, because if you guys remember, it was i over i plus 2. So for i equals 1, that's just 1 third. There's no mu dependence at all. So we expect that maybe it's not going to be right, and we want to see what it comes out to be. So, to start with just one point, mu equals 1, this is the normal diffusion case. And one thing to note is that it gives 0.35 instead of 1 third. Now this is because when you do these random walks on a square lattice, the islands that are formed are actually fractal. They're not perfectly filled in two-dimensional islands. So the theory has to be adjusted a little bit to account for these fractal islands. This is stuff that is known from previous work and stuff that has been measured in previous work. So this is just a correction to be clear about what's going on. So now what about mu less than 1? This is what I spent the whole summer coming up with. 
And this is what we get. So definitely there's a mu dependence, right? This is not a constant. So definitely this doesn't fit the old theoretical picture. So what do we do? Um, classical theory doesn't work. And the short answer is Dr. Amar came up with a new theory uh, while I was working on this. And he kind of came up with it at the same time, and also motivated by these results and motivated by results for superdiffusion that had been worked on before. So basically, we come up with a new theory for a new chi. Okay? And we plug in the values that we're dealing with, that we've simulated. So i equals 1, our dimension equals 2. So d is the dimension of the substrate. And again, the fractal dimension is 1.7. And so here, we have a new theory, and it depends on you. Okay? So how does it hold up? Very, very well. Can you guys all see that line? It's beautiful. Uh, so it holds up well. The theory fit the experiment, the simulation, pretty well. Um, there are small deviations here with mu equals 0.2 and 0.75, um, but these deviations actually make sense. So we think here that we weren't getting to a high enough diffusion rate. And with higher, with higher mu, you start to run into problems with the system size being too small and sort of the infinite size effects. But overall, we get this beautiful picture where this new theory matches the new data pretty well. And what's especially exciting about this, which bleeds over into the, to the conclusion, what's especially exciting about this is that this theory reproduces the results for normal diffusion. So it works for what we knew before. And it also seems to be reproducing the results we're getting for super diffusion. So this is great because potentially we have this theory that describes all the different kinds of diffusion in terms of in terms of the chi. So future and ongoing work are to kind of get uh, even better statistics for the subdiffusive case. That's something I'll be working on. So going to larger system sizes, making sure we really kill the statistics on this stuff. Um, also study the super diffusive case and do a lot of simulations for that. Um, the graduate student Natun Padar, who works with me and Dr. Amar is working on that. And also looking at this different exponent, x, not chi, which is related to the scaling of the average capture number. So this is just another variable we can look at to distinguish between these two things. And uh, <coughs> that's, that's about it. So I'd like to thank Dr. Mark for being a great mentor and making this a great experience. Natun Padar, the graduate student who's worked with both of us. Greg Irving, uh, Linda, the entire faculty here, you guys have been great. This has been a great program, great experience. And of course, the National Science Foundation for funding me so I can come out here and do this stuff. Thanks, guys. Any questions for Michael? Yes. Yeah, so can you have like the front where you describe all three diffusion? Yes. Nice. Uh, there we go. Here. Yeah. Wait, so like, or, or yeah, that's my previous one? Yeah, the previous one. Okay. What, so like these, the path length, is that, is there like an, a num a strict number that determines whether it's like normal diffusion, super diffusion, or sub diffusion, or is it, is it more like? No, so, so this is, so this is really what determines which kind of diffusion it is. Oh. But you can imagine that, so I think what you're asking is how many steps do I yeah, take? Yeah. Right. So you can imagine that if it's the, whatever number it is, if it's the same number, then it's just like diffusion, it's just got different units of distance, right? So it has to be a number that's changing. And physically, for physical examples, it's usually a random number. It's usually something that follows the distribution. So, uh, so with the new theory, then, you're able to use that expression with the appropriate substitutions to talk about all three of the different regions, then? Yes, yeah, so that's, cool. what's, that's what's exciting about it. That wasn't your very good trip. No, no, no. That was so the new theory. It was an Amar theory. Yeah, it was an Amar theory. So the, the derivation was kind of separate from the data, but once it's already finished, we just plot it. So these are these are not empirical fits. This is the um, new concept which I put in, which has to do with the dependence of the average capture number on ion density. And I, those are the constants that are in the expression then. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the capture numbers, so I'm just going to go back to the rate equations. So, so these are the capture numbers, 
these things. And traditionally, in the traditional theory to get the traditional chi, it's assumed that it doesn't depend on the, the island density, right? Yeah. The average capture number does not depend on the island density. These are individual capture numbers that are very complicated. Right. But to, the, to get the exponent chi, you only need the average capture number. <coughs> Any other questions for Michael? All right. Thanks, Michael. Thank